There are a number of things that we could talk about today, and I'd be happy to respond to questions about uh, any aspect of my work. Um, the, you know, the post-evangelicalism turn in my work is of interest to a lot of people. We could talk about that. Um, the LGBT inclusion work, we could, if you wanted, we could talk about that, <clears throat> especially as that issue continues to be politicized and is an aspect of, of even the political situation in Eastern Europe, uh, as well as here. Um, we could talk about a number of things, but in light of the trauma uh, that you are undergoing in uh, Ukraine, and in light of work that I have done on the concept of human dignity or the sacredness of life, and in, in light of the theme of your conference, I decided to pick up a paper that summarized uh, my work on the idea that human life is sacred. And the book is this one here, um, The Sacredness of Human Life, came out in 2013 with Erdman's. So the paper I am going to read to you was presented at Oxford University, I think it was 2012, to an audience that was a mix of believers and non-believers, philosophers, theologians, lawyers, jurists. Um, and, and so that's the backdrop. But I, I wanted to present it to you again today and, and, and then see how it lands 10 years later in light of what you all are, are facing. Um, I believe that the, the themes of this presentation are of I mean, they're well-grounded theologically and biblically and ought to be relevant in any setting. But, but the thing about ethics is ethics always is contextual. The people who are attempting to follow Jesus are doing so in various settings, suffering various things. And sometimes the concepts of Christian ethics are challenged profoundly uh, because of the nature of the context. And I believe that is certainly the case with the idea that each and every human life is sacred in wartime, especially in the context of an aggressive war against the people uh, who are innocent, um, who have done nothing to merit the aggression. So let's just see how this paper lands, and then uh, we'll talk about it, okay? Uh, so here we go. This paper is called A Christian Theological Account of Human Worth, and the abstract is this. This paper argues that biblical revelation served as the most important source for the still critically important moral claim that each human life carries profound worth, and the related moral and legal demand that each human being's dignity must be respected. In Christian terms, this means that the real issue is what I call the God-declared sacredness of each human life with correlated moral obligations rather than merely human dignity. I enter into the biblical materials to present in their own distinctive ways central elements that gave birth to a sacredness of life norm and continue to undergird that norm today. I reserve a few comments at the end to discuss how and why sacredness of human life became a language like human dignity and what was lost and maybe gained when that transition occurred in the modern period. In this paper, I take the somewhat uh, contrarian perspective that the concept of human dignity is a half, as a half <coughs> a half-secularized remnant of an earlier Jewish and Christian concept best labeled as the sacred worth of the human person in the sight of God, or more simply, the sacredness of human life. I invest the majority of these pages in excavating the original biblical sources, in part so that the memory of them is not altogether lost, and in part to make a Protestant contribution to the contemporary conversation that centers on the term human dignity. So, on the language of sacredness, 
it is not uncommon even today to hear Jews and Christians and sometimes others claim something like human life is sacred or to speak about the sanctity of human life. Common usage of these phrases reveals often high passion and limited understanding of what they actually mean. It seems reasonable as a first step to seek a deeper understanding of what might once have been meant or might still be meant when such terms are used. The Oxford English Dictionary offers the following definitions for the word in English, sanctity. One, holiness of life or saintliness. Two, the quality of being sacred or hallowed, sacredness, claim to religious reverence or inviolability. But the Oxford English Dictionary's more extensive definition of the word sacred yields a striking discovery. This English adjective actually emerges from an obsolete verb, sacre, which meant to consecrate, sacrifice, or make holy, to dedicate something such as a person to a deity, to make a class of things sacred to a deity. The adjective sacred carries forward this range of meanings. A sacred thing is an object or being that someone has made sacred, that is, has dedicated, consecrated, or venerated. The adjective sacred now assumes the action of the lost verb sacre, but because we have lost the verb, it is easy to lose any sense of agency, any sense of who, if anyone, bears responsibility for having consecrated or made sacred. The word sanctity in English carries a particular moral connotation, such as purity, holiness, or virtue. Subtly linking the term to character qualities achieved by the person who has attained something like sanctity. Sacredness, I believe, by contrast, clearly reflects an ascribed status, referring to something or someone having received a special status through consecration ascribed by another. Sacredness, then, is the more appropriate term to get at what the biblical traditions have sought to say about human worth. Sanctity would be the more appropriate term to use when talking about human virtue. My explorations of a variety of cases in which an object, place, or person has been ascribed the status of sacred reveals a pattern that I call the sacredness paradigm. It is not inextricably tied to belief in God, though most often in history it has been religiously motivated. It goes something like this. Number one, one item or object or person from among a class of ordinary things is lifted up from the midst of its ordinary companions and designated as having elevated rank or special status. This elevation or consecration or hallowing or sacralizing of this now sacred, whatever it is, is undertaken by some agency, whether it's collective or individual, human or divine, whose authority to make such a designation is accepted by the community. Third, a variety of reasons can exist for why this particular item is declared sacred, but for those making and acknowledging the designation of sacred, the reasons are compelling. Fourth, the special or sacred status evokes an attitude or posture of awe, veneration, or reverence in relation to the designated object. Fifth, this attitudinal or attitude posture is expected to be accompanied by moral obligations within the community to treat the designated object or person with due respect and even special care and to prevent any desecration of, of it. Finally, this moral obligation to preserve what is often called the inviolability of the sacred item or person or deity or object is normally accompanied by negative sanctions or punishments for those who violate the sacred. When religious people today use the phrase sacredness of human life, 
they are not saying that some human beings are sacred and others are not. Instead, they are saying that each and every human life is sacred. Every human being is to be set apart as sacred by divine command or decision. This move in Christian theology conforms to the sacredness paradigm that I just described while departing from it in a crucial way. It conforms to it in that those who make a claim that every human being is sacred intend something like the six steps I just identified. The only difference is in the first step. No longer is one from among a class of ordinary things lifted up above the others. Now, each and every member of the class human being is elevated to a status of sacredness. The great innovation in Jewish and Christian thought was not the ascription of sacred worth to some human beings. This was already common, usually with reference to the royal classes. What was new and revelatory was the way the sacred texts of Judaism and Christianity bore witness to the claim that God has ascribed sacred worth to all persons. Visible in the sacred texts and sometimes in the practices of these biblical religions was the sacredness of human life ethic applied to all persons and carried forward today among some practitioners of these faiths. I define the Christian sacredness of human life ethic in this way. To say that each human life or human life as such is sacred is to claim that God has consecrated each and every human being without exception and in all circumstances as a unique incalculably precious being of elevated status and dignity. Through God's revelation in scripture and incarnation in Jesus Christ, God has declared and demonstrated the sacred worth of human beings, and God will hold all human beings accountable for responding and acting appropriately. Such a response properly begins by adopting a posture of reverence and by accepting moral responsibility for the sacred gift that is even a single human life. It includes offering due respect and care to each human being that we encounter. It extends to an obligation to protect human life from wanton destruction, desecration, or violation. A full embrace of the sacredness of human life leads to a full commitment to the fostering of human flourishing way beyond survival extending to the flourishing of human beings and all of our God-given capacities. While there may be a variety of paths toward developing such an exalted view of the worth <clears throat> and proper treatment of the human being, the source for such a theology in at least our civilization, I think, can be traced to the sacred texts of the Bible and the religious traditions of Judaism and Christianity, which were uh, which produced and were nurtured by these texts. <clears throat> so let's turn to scripture. The sacred scriptures of the Hebrew Bible and New Testament have, for millennia, borne witness to belief in the God-given sacredness of each human life. Now, the biblical witness is not unequivocal, and countervailing elements can be found in scripture, we need to acknowledge that. Here, of course, a theology of, of, this, of scripture is relevant that allows us to be able to see um, a diversity in the canon. Suffice it to say that I believe the Bible contains traces of what God communicated to Israel, to the church and to humanity, as well as plenty of evidence of that divine communication being heard properly and also misheard, being obeyed and also disobeyed. I believe that biblical traces of the sacredness of life norm represent divine revelation well heard and sometimes well obeyed, and that it is therefore appropriate to test biblical and post-biblical texts, traditions, and behavior by the criteria established by this ethical norm. The Hebrew Bible offers 
at least four bodies of material that bear witness to elements of a sacredness of life ethic. And these are creation theology, God's compassionate care for human beings, especially the suffering, covenantal and legal materials, and the prophetic vision of a just wholeness or shalom for Israel and all creation. Ultimately, I believe the conviction that human life is sacred receives its firmest grounding in the Bible's revelation of the character, activity, and decision of God, which lies at the root of all prescriptions related to how human beings should be perceived and treated. So let me now turn to briefly to each of these bodies of biblical material, which will be the heart of the paper here. <coughs> so first, uh, creation themes. Most Christian declarations about life sacredness begin with the claim that human life is sacred because it was created in the image of God. Genesis 1 and 2 tell us that humans do not come from nowhere. We are the creative handiwork of God. This claim by itself elevates human worth. Further, God is equally the creator of all humans. All references to humanity in Genesis 1 are references to all humanity. And the blessings and tasks given to human beings are given to all. There is one God who makes one humanity. This is a pivotal element of biblical creation theology, and it contributes at least an implicit primal human equality and unity. The creation narrative found in Genesis 2, believed by scholars to be the older account, adds another important element. It tells a story in which God begins to create humanity by creating a first woman and then a first a first man and then a first woman out of the first man. From these first parents come absolutely everyone else. In this sense, we are all kin all part of one vast human family. Genesis 2, therefore, teaches a primal human kinship, unity, and equality by narrating a story in which all human beings come from one common ancestor or couple. These claims help equalize human status and teach us to value human beings far beyond those who are most closely connected to us. The claim that human beings are made in the image and likeness of God has attracted a disproportionate amount of theological attention, I think. It is an important claim, to be sure, but its intended original meaning is uncertain and cannot always bear the weight that it has been asked to bear. I accept the, the conclusion, tentatively at least, that the biblical writer probably did intend for image of God to signal some kind of resemblance between God and humans. This resemblance may include recognition of special human intellectual, spiritual, and moral capacities over against what were presumed to be the lower capacities of the non-human creatures. But a capacities-oriented rendering of the divine image has proven vulnerable to various problems. Its vulnerability has resurfaced whenever claims about the supposed intellectual, spiritual, or moral incapacity or dysfunction of individuals or groups have been made. These issues have proven deeply problematic in terms of various kinds of historic prejudices and ethnocentrisms, as well as in relation to contemporary bioethical concerns like um, decisions at the end of life. This is one reason why it is probably better to understand the image of God as having to do with special responsibilities rather than capacities. Humans image God to one another and to the rest of creation through our representation of God's rule on earth. This seems a natural inference from the text of Genesis 1 itself, given the direct connection between the declaration of the image of God in humanity and the command to exercise dominion over the creatures. The latter, however we understand it today, is a kind of royal function with the significance here that all human beings, not just kings and queens, are a kind of royalty and carry a kind of royal authority on earth. Secondly, God as sustainer, rescuer, and liberator. The Hebrew Bible teaches that God sustains, cares for, rescues, and acts to liberate people made in the divine image. 
Despite our ascribed grandeur, we are vulnerable creatures subject to great misery and suffering. The Bible reports that God's universal sustaining care for creation, including humanity, took a more focused form in God's compassionate response to the suffering of the people of Israel when they were enslaved and threatened with mass murder in Egypt. The numerous biblical examples of God's care for needy and suffering people have impressed themselves deeply on the consciousness of peoples and cultures affected by the Bible. It is hard to overstate the significance of the Exodus narrative in particular. For the Jewish people, this founding narrative of God's compassionate deliverance has been fundamental. Its echoes resound through later biblical writings and in every generation of Jewish life. Deuteronomy 15, you shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt and the Lord your God redeemed you. This memory instructs Israel as to the character of God, one who keeps covenant promises, one who looks with compassionate love on Israel, one who delivers Israel when it appears that all is lost. God is a God of justice, who fights for Israel's liberation when Israel is victimized. This foundational understanding of God's character also demands of Israel that her way of life as a people reflect responsiveness in covenant fidelity, compassionate love and justice, central themes in the law and the prophets. This Exodus-shaped vision has been embraced by many suffering peoples in human history. Philosopher Michael Walzer has shown the endless creativity and value of the Exodus text for inspiring social revolutions in the name of justice. Third, God is lawmaker and judge. The biblical narrative moves from Exodus to Sinai, from deliverance to law. It is highly significant that God, God is depicted as the ultimate source of law in Israel, and God holds this covenant people accountable for obedience. If God is the source of law, then the full weight of God's sovereignty and majesty and power fall upon the law. The law therefore carries a tremendous holiness and authority, even a sacredness. The very idea that there is a divinely given moral law that governs Israel, and more than Israel it, at points, is itself a major contribution to a sacredness of life ethic. It means that God sets the terms for how human beings must relate both to God and to others. Human moral obligation is ultimately rooted in God's law, God's will. The foundation for all morality is the character and will of God who is supreme. There will be no higher standard of obligation. Such an ethic is starkly different than any other ethic based merely on personal preference, social power, human reason, or communal tradition, or, or anything else. God's revealed will establishes a transcendent reference point by which all life is to be governed and by which all human laws and actions are to be evaluated. This elevation of a transcendent legal moral standard over human life re reinforces momentum towards human equality before the law. In many cultures, the ruler defines the law and is above the law. But as far back as the Hebrew Bible, the kings of Israel were accountable to God's law, the same law that governed everyone else. David Plines has written, we see in the formulation of the Ten Commandments the makings of a subtle critique of monarchy and an attempt to limit its powers. Here, each and every member of the community has a religious, moral, and social duty toward the nation's deity. The many kings who were tempted to forget that their will was not absolute in Israel often ended up paying a serious price for their disobedience and pride. The only context in which this kind of thing can happen is a society that, be that believed in divinely given moral law and the accountability of all to God's law with a socially acknowledged role for prophets who could demand compliance and return in God's name. Overall, the power of law to level the playing field in human life has the effect of weakening the strong and strengthening the weak. The standard is this, all stand equal before the law and before those charged with enforcing it. 
If any member of a particular political community has moral and legal rights, all have such rights. One way that we come to know that all human beings of all classes and races are to be perceived as sacred and treated with respect is because we are supposed to be able to see it happen in the administration of the law. In Israel, where law was seen as divinely given, a failure to administer justice according to law was treated as a direct affront to the God who stands behind the law. Certainly, Old Testament law has many gaps and many problems, but the texts, as we have them, contain striking elements that move in the direction of the comprehensive valuing of human life. Even today, even in societies that long ago abandoned a theocratic understanding of law or government, biblical law has left an impact on the construction of societies that value the rule of law and attempt to include every citizen as an equal before the law. Fourth Hebrew Bible theme, God is the deliverer who brings shalom at last. I believe that one of the Hebrew Bible's key resources for a sacredness of life ethic is found in the demand and the yearning for a transformed world of justice and peace. The concept of shalom in Hebrew names a state of affairs in which human beings flourish in community and the sacred worth of each, each and every human life is finally honored. It means an end to our division, hostility, and fear, our drivenness and misery. The Hebrew prophets both demand shalom now and yearn for it in the future when the time comes that God finally prevails and all this conflict and suffering ends. Christian ethicist Karen Labax argued that an ethic of justice is often developed most profoundly amid the experience of injustice. Likewise, the prophetic yearning for shalom begins with, within Israel's experiences of violence and injustice. Prophets speak about shalom from within the cataclysm of war. From exile, they speak of the land and people of Israel coming back from the dead in a kind of new exodus. They yearn for a new Jerusalem from within the experience of the destruction of Jerusalem. The prophetic writings left a legacy both of particularity and universality. They speak to specific events, injustices, and dreams of the Jewish people, while also still having the moral power to evoke yearnings on the part of millions of people for the kind of world envisioned so many millennia ago. The narrowest translation for Shalom is of course peace, as in the opposite of war, and peace is certainly a part of it. The prophets demand peace from the covenant people Israel when they decry Israel's own violence and murder and Israel's turn to military alliances and military might. They yearn for peace and an end to war when they envision Isaiah 9-7, endless peace, and Micah 4, Zechariah 9, the time when they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Shalom means peace, as in security, straightforward security from physical threat to bodies, homes, and communities. In several places, God promises a covenant of peace. Phrases like, violence shall no more be heard in your land. Security is so complete, as in Isaiah 60, your gate shall always be open day and night, they shall not be shut. Eventually, shalom is so complete that God will, quote, destroy on this mountain the shroud that is cast over all peoples. God will swallow up death forever. Shalom, as Irvin Greenberg, rabbi, um, American rabbi, has put it, shalom means the triumph of life and the overcoming of death. This is the mission of God in the world, and in Rabbi Greenberg's view, it remains the task shared within both Judaism and Christianity. In summary, the Hebrew Bible bears witness to a divinely declared elevation of the grandeur and worth of each human life, while also containing numerous exhortations to corresponding moral behavior on the part of humanity, and especially the covenant people Israel. Such elevated status and respect are not merited. They're not merited by something good about us. There's no talk of something like intrinsic human dignity. Human life is valuable 
because God values it. And God's valuing is clear in creation, sustaining, liberating, governing, delivering, and redeeming, even in the face of our defiance and disobedience. Human life must be treated with respect because God requires it, because it is the only proper response to the revealed will of God. The New Testament builds on and extends these themes from the Hebrew Bible through its focus on the earthly ministry of Jesus, on the incarnation, and on the way of life of the early church. So that's where I'll move next as we head towards the end of this paper. So Jesus, the earthly ministry of Christ. <clears throat> The strands of text and tradition cited above flow forward into this one. Because Jesus was a faithful son of Israel and a creative expositor of Israel's traditions. Jesus carried forward in profound ways all four themes noted above. He articulated a creation theology affirming God as creator and God's sustaining care for human beings and all of creation. He employed his power over creation to manifest care and healing rescuing and raising people from the dead. He taught and exemplified compassionate deliverance for suffering people. He offered such deliverance through suffering love rather than violence. He offered a rendering of Jewish legal norms that affirmed and heightened the protections offered to human life. And he articulated and embodied the prophetic vision of shalom in the future. <clears throat> Jesus elevated the sacredness of life also through his rejection of violence and his teaching of peacemaking. He rejected the sad cycle of human violence in a context of Jewish subjugation under Rome. The early church became convinced that such violence did not fit a community seeking to imitate Jesus. We can talk about this, of course, how this reads now. A key element of the sacredness of life is its inclusiveness. Every life counts. Every individual is welcomed. No groups are diminished. No categories of people are privileged above others. Jesus embodied this inclusiveness in his ministry. His example pushed Christians toward the development of love for each and every human being, not that we haven't fallen short many times. Jesus' expansive embrace and valuing of marginalized ones is clear. Women, the sick, the disabled, children, the poor, Samaritans, Roman soldiers, the dying, and so on. The early church understood that its Lord had taught radical, radical inclusiveness and expansive community, as well as hospitality. Jesus taught about a God of radical forgiveness and love. Acutely clear about human rebellion against God. Even so, Jesus declared that God loves every person. He spoke about how God loves not just those who love God, but those who are God's enemies. He called any who would claim to be the children of God to love enemies in the same manner. Jesus said that God pays attention even to the life of a sparrow and all the more attends to providing for our human material needs, which frees us to trust God and serve others. He describes God as being like a loving father who can be counted on to give good gifts to his children, which authorizes us to ask for what we need and trust that it will be given. He compared God to a shepherd who goes after the one lost sheep. Jesus offered reminders of God's special care for those who especially need it, including children and the poor, the abandoned and the sick, the imprisoned and the hungry. These reminders were often accompanied by teachings requiring all who would be his followers to imitate this way of life most powerfully in Matthew 25, 31 through 46. Love attends especially to those who need it the most, and God will hold us accountable for such love. John's Gospel has these famous words, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The bottom line is this divine saving love for the world, for humans, for each and every human, and for creation. This is the ultimate foundation of Christian belief in the sacredness of human life. In its origins, my claim is that all Christian assertions about the sacredness of life or even human dignity are theological claims that for God's sake, 
and in obedience to God, we must prize and protect human life. Now to the incarnation. Christianity's theologians have seen significance for human worth, not just in the ministry of Christ, but in the very fact of Jesus Christ, the God-man. They have pondered the implications of God becoming human in Jesus, as well as his death, resurrection, and ascension. Christian theologians have often been moved to proclaim that if God became human, the status of the human changes. No human can be seen as worthless. No human life can be treated cruelly or destroyed capriciously. Human dignity as such can never again be rejected and can never be confined to only a few groups or a few individuals. The incarnation elevates the status of humans everywhere at any time. It elevates the worth of every human being at every stage of their lives. God not only took flesh in Christ, God sacrificed that flesh at the cross. The staggering New Testament claim deepens belief in the extent of God's love and care for humanity. God stopped at nothing to save us, to reach out to us in redemption. The intensity of this conviction is deepened when Christians emphasize that Christ died for each and every human being, friend and foe, good and evil. Belief in the sacredness of life is deepened by reflection on the cross. The terrible suffering and death of Jesus Christ and what it says about how much God values each and every human being has contributed profoundly to a Christian moral tradition that exalts the immeasurable worth of the human being. The resurrection of Christ signifies the victory of God over evil, including the evil that took Jesus to the cross. In the resurrection, God triumphs, and God signals that in the end, God will triumph over Satan and over all forces that bring suffering and death, even death itself is destroyed. The sacredness of life, when fully realized, will be part of this ultimate victory of God over the evil that has harmed and destroyed human lives. In the incarnation, the one through whom all things were made, the one who sustains and holds together the creation itself, became flesh, took on human life. At the cross, this human being suffered and lost his life. But in the resurrection, Jesus lives again, and therefore life wins. God is for life. The historic confession of the church is not just that Jesus rose from the dead, but that he ascended to heaven, whereas the creeds say he is seated at the right hand of the Father, from which he shall come to judge the living and the dead. Remembering that the Jesus who rose from the dead was fully God and fully human, Karl Barth said this, the real mystery of Easter is not that God is glorified in it, but that man is exalted, raised to the right hand of God, and permitted to triumph over sin, death, and the devil. God stoops low so that humanity can be exalted. Human beings must be viewed and treated as those whose divinely intended destiny is to dwell eternally along with Jesus the Son in the presence of God the Father. Humanity was made for an eternal destiny. This theme is often sounded in Christian declarations on the sacredness of human life. The ministry of the early church. What ultimately emerged in early Christianity, always imperfectly, of course, were congregations gathered around Jesus Christ, believing that in their own early experiences of transformed human relations lay the beginnings of the redemption of the world. Christ came, died, and rose again. The world at large remained in the grip of dark forces, of principalities and powers, of evil. And yet in Christian churches, new seeds of eschatological community could be found. Here, rich and poor, young and old, male and female, Jew and Greek, slave and free, celebrated God's transforming love in Jesus. And before this transforming love, all stand equal. Equally needy, equally blessed, equally grateful. Until Christ returned, the early church would seek to live in love toward one another and to all. Instructed to avoid all forms of malice and ill will to anyone, Christians would instead seek to contribute only good to their neighbors, beginning with their near neighbors in Christian community, but extending beyond the household of faith. They would do so until Christ returned. Last section of the paper, from sacredness of life to human dignity. 
The scriptures of the Hebrew Bible and New Testament and the Jewish and Christian theological traditions that are rooted there offer what can be described as thick, thick theological accounts of human worth, dense, full of content. Faith communities immersed in these sacred texts were the bearers over many centuries of a profound sacredness of human life, theological tradition that helped to shape the cultures that Judaism and Christianity left their deep mark upon. Eventually, however, the cultural imprint of these thick religious traditions began to fade or to be explicitly rejected. One major reason they faded, of course, is because Christians radically failed to live out their own ethical vision. Christianity's moral vision became compromised by its unholy partnership with political power and its tragic participation in injustice and violence, both in Europe and wherever Europeans went. One could hardly begin to name all of these moral failures, but one especially poignant place to start is, is with the long history of Christian anti-Semitism. We could also name, of course, this, the wars of religion, imperialism, slavery, colonialism. Amid all of this, the credibility of Christianity was badly damaged, and its powerful leading role in European civilization was rejected. The story of secularization is complex, of course, and disputed. There were many reasons why Christian intellectual influence faded in the West. But my own explorations lead me to a couple of very basic conclusions. One is that, is that philosophers and, and moralists today, even today, remain deeply affected by the Christian theological ethical background of Western culture even when they seek mightily to shift the foundation of moral claims to reason or law or some other basis. I would say well into the 19th century, Europe's leading moralists retained an articulation of human worth that was still elevated and profound, but they did so while cutting that ethic off from its original theological foundation. Gradually what developed was the abandonment or largely the abandonment of sacredness of life language and the transition to human dignity language. And then it was human dignity grounded in reason rather than revelation. Eventually more radical thinkers rejected not only the theological foundation of human dignity and divine revelation, but the moral idea of human dignity. The moral vision that the moral visions that succeeded belief in human dignity uh, tended towards nihilism and even violence. I am persuaded that human dignity as deployed in ethical discourse today, while it's valuable, it remains a relatively thin secularization of an originally more dense theological claim about sacred human worth the reasons it should be recognized in, in the character and, re and revealed will of God, and the moral obligations that attend such recognition. Human dignity has a kind of value as a crossover term, a term that can be, you know, employed by believers and non-believers in secular and legal settings, as well as religious ones. But now it has its own formidable intellectual history and has yielded good fruit in philosophy, law, and culture. It has the perhaps indispensable virtue in a globalized and diverse world of being able to bridge all kinds of diversity in religion, politics, law, and intellect. But I don't think the phrase human dignity quite conveys the depth of theological meaning carried by the earlier religious language of the God-given, God-declared, God-demanded sacred worth of human life. It does not fully capture the central convictions of the Christian tradition when it comes to human worth. The best contemporary contribution of the Christian tradition to this discussion of human dignity may be to retrieve the richest possible exposition of the sacredness of human life vision as it is found in our theological tradition and to commend it for continued conversation today. That's the end of my paper. Um, but I want to say one last thing and then throw it open for discussion. In 2003, 2004, in the United States, after the 9-11 attacks, um, 
the United States government authorized the torture of people. It happened on a fairly widespread scale. And the, though it has, well, has never really been officially acknowledged by the US government, it is obvious that it happened and we've never really come to terms with it as a country. I, I discovered during that time that the United States kind of conversational climate lacked the ability to have a conversation about the morality of torture that did not default to utilitarianism. So in other words, when we were actively debating whether we should be torturing people, most public conversation would go around to things like, uh, is it effective? Does it get good intelligence? Does it work? Or maybe sometimes, is it legal? But nobody seemed to be able to, to ask the, you know, kind of the right or wrong question beyond that. I worked at that time on um, uh, teams that were attempting to push back against torture on moral grounds. And it was during that period that I rediscovered the centrality of the language of the sacred worth of the person and the absoluteness of the language and of the, the values underneath it helped to ground resistance to torture, absolute resistance to torture. Um, you're not allowed to torture people under any circumstances for any reason. This is what we argued in 2005, six and seven, and we argued it on explicitly theological grounds. I believe that that, that sturdiness of conviction is required, especially when it is most tested and it tends to be tested in situations of wartime and atrocity. The sacredness of human life tradition, I think, is at the basis um, both of pacifism and of just war theory properly understood. Um, I have argued um, that, that just war has norms that are intended to respect and honor the sacredness of human life. For example, um, norms against torture and norms against killing uh, prisoners of war. And if you go deep into the language of just, uh, in the tradition of just war theory, Part of what sets limits on the conduct of war, on the attitudes of warriors, on the treatment of non-combatants, um, on the treatment of prisoners of war, are sacredness of life norms. Now, I, I think it's really interesting, as you said, war, war tests ethics. Um, I personally, uh, never embraced pacifism, though I also never made much of an argument on behalf of war. I followed my teacher, Glenn Stassen, in supporting just peacemaking. And just peacemaking, you know, proposes various norms for and practices for preventing war from starting in the first place. Glenn really, Glenn Stassen of Fuller Seminary, really wanted to, to, to push Christians to emphasize just peacemaking because the older argument and an often stalemated argument was about just war versus pacifism, right? I do believe that the, the obvious injustice of the invasion of Ukraine and the atrocities and cruelties that have been committed um, is another reminder of why the just war tradition was developed and of its value. Um, one of the things that I would, I would push back against is in just war theory, classically understood, the warrior, even the the, uh, the defensive warrior, the warrior who is defending a uh, territory that has been attacked, is supposed to avoid hatred and dehumanization of the aggressor. There is an effort in just war theory to purify the intention, even of the defensive warrior, so that so that the goal is, you might say, it's more clinical. It's to defeat the aggressor, drive him back across the borders of his own country and, and to restore a, a state of peace. It is not um, 
a will to crush. It is a it is more a desire to restore a just peace. Um, and one of the things that just that sacredness of life um, training, I think, helps warriors do is to is to set even even those who who have justice on their side is to set some limits on their own behavior and on their attitudes. I am not surprised that pacifism has been weakened profoundly during uh, in Ukraine during this conflict. Um, I do hope that there's there is good reflection happening about about the best um, tradition of just war theory, so that um, moral considerations are being weighed as they be um, even now. One reason I moved from an evangelical to a post-evangelical um, posture for myself was because, at least in the U.S. setting, evangelicals found it difficult to face honestly the diverse and sometimes quite contradictory strands of the Bible. We, we tried speaking of evangelicals, we needed to say that the Bible uh, has kind of a univocal message and there's never any conflict. If it seems that there's a conflict, it's because we're misunderstanding. And, and that, that way of reading the Bible extended from little things like resurrection story details, right? You know, uh, to, to major themes. And so what I would say is that the sacredness of life trajectory is there in the scripture. And it's, I, I would describe it as revelational. It's powerful. It, it, um, it is transformative. It leads to good fruit. But you are absolutely right that there are other strands. The, the Holy War strand and, you know, Joshua and so on. Um, I mean, Jesus felt like he could summarize the teaching of the tradition as love your neighbors and hate your enemies, right? And then say, no, love your enemies too. So he got that from somewhere, right? It was in the air. Um, it is also quite possible to read our traditional theology of heaven and hell in sometimes gleeful condemnation of the unbeliever to hell as i mean i've heard people say if god's gonna make them if god's gonna throw them into fire forever nothing we do to them can compare to that right so so there are other strands the role i think of christian leaders is to honestly grapple with all the strands while saying here's the most constructive for following Jesus faithfully, for making a good contribution morally, um, for being the best version of ourselves that we can be. So that does not require us to have uh, a mythological understanding of our own tradition, but to make the best of the tradition that we have and of the biblical resources that we have. And so I wrote the Sacredness of Human Life book in 2012. If if I were writing it today, I would probably be, I spend a little bit more time on the more troubling strands and then say, and be more explicit about saying, these must be named and rejected in favor of this other strand that I'm now going to tell you about. I, I do that some, but not as much in that book as I would today. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm glad you remembered that, yeah, July 20th, it's a big day. For everybody who studies World War II and Bonhoeffer, this, this is a big day. Um, I've studied Bonhoeffer uh, pretty closely, too, and I think that when you read, when you read uh, his ethics, he, he, is, he reaffirms, he, he doesn't use the language of sacred worth but um on the section on the on the meaning of natural life he 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 moves in some similar directions 
Um, and yet, during the same period, uh, he is he is deep into the resistance and he is the chaplain of the of the resistance. And in some way or another, I'm quite convinced he was involved in and had knowledge of what eventually became assassination conspiracies uh, against Hitler. Um, I think that well, I'm fairly sure that that Bonhoeffer had very good knowledge of the reign of death that the, that the Nazis were, were delivering in Eastern Europe. And um, he, had, he had as good information as anybody. And he was also aware of the bombs coming home to Germany from the Allied forces and all then the reign of death from the sky over Germany. Essentially, I think that Bonhoeffer concluded that that the way to follow Jesus in responsibility, given his role and his access, um, and in light of the, the bloodshed being uh, caused by the Nazi regime, was a strike to decapitate the head of the Nazi government. Um, it was uh, tyrannicide. He never explicitly... Um, well, he comes very close to making a case for tyrannicide. He never says that such an action is innocent. But he does say that sometimes we must take responsibility for actions that are not innocent. And I think that that, that gets at um, some of the logic of defensive violence in wartime and, and even... Um, even the extraordinary case of a tyrannicide effort as in the case of Hitler in 1944 in light of everything, in light of the failure of every other effort to change the character and behaviors of that regime. Um, so obviously the downside to this kind of thinking is when, where does it stop? Uh, how many more acts of violence? Uh, what are the limits of it? But, but yeah, um, I see Bonhoeffer as moving from a kind of purist pacifism in discipleship to a more nuanced kind of tragic, necessary violence posture, at least by the, by the ethics and certainly by his involvement in the conspiracy. And my own thinking uh, is more comfortable with the later Bonhoeffer than with the earlier Bonhoeffer in light of all factors. If, if we were made by God um, with this exalted moral responsibility and capacity and with the possibility of developing into the kind of person who, um, who fully realizes what God made us to be, or at least moves in that direction, then... <clears throat> then it is also the case that a moral collapse or a deterioration or degradation can set in in a person, for that matter, it can set in in a regime um, or a country. Um, and, and one could, I think it can, one can easily be understood as desecrating oneself as as morally degrading oneself you know where where this uh language is discussed a lot in american christian ethics has to do with racism here uh a lot of the works that i've read by african americans about white racism historically and today uh, dr king used to say this it's degrading more degrading to the racist than it is to the target of the racism because it represents such a, such a grotesque collapse as to what we were made to be, um, such a disfiguring of, of the human face, of the, of the human mentality, that yes, one can desecrate oneself um, through the attitudes that one adopts and the behaviors that, that a person uh, embraces um, and, and, and performs. So that's a really great point. 
the word sanctity in English, I, I think of as mainly speaking to the moral dimension. Like you might say that is a person of sanctity. That means like holiness. So you might say that a person who is actualizing the potential that God gave us morally can be described as a person of sanctity. Um, but a person who is de degrading what God made us to be is the opposite of that. It's, it's unsanctity. It's, it's desecration in a different sense. And so in Christian moral teaching, we would want to speak to both, both to actions and to character. Um, and we need to have a language to describe what happens when people become evil and give themselves into or up to the degradation of other people. Uh, and that is, uh, means the degradation of the, of the aggressor, of the victimizer as well. Yes. I have also heard the rhetoric uh, coming out of parts of the Russian Orthodox Church that, that the war is interpreted as something like a holy war to cleanse and purify Ukraine, either of Western liberal or decadent elements, um, or, or even just to reunite the Ukrainian Orthodox Church to the, to the Russian Orthodox Church or something like that. Um, this is a reminder that language of, you might say, holiness or purity or sacredness um, can be used in a variety of different ways. Um, in the just war tradition, war is never understood as sacred, holy, purifying. Um, sometimes defensive war is morally justifiable but the language of holiness, sacredness, and purity does not really belong with war. Um, when that language is used, it, it tends to be um, in association with, with uh, what we call crusade or holy war thinking, in which war is no longer um, just a kind of an earthly affair between countries uh, or something, but instead is a divine cause of God, right? Um, aggressive war in the name of God to purify people, um, that, that's all very dangerous thinking. And it is, it is the worst aspect of the Christian tradition on war is when war is like aggressive war is waged in the name of holiness or God. One thing about that that is really dangerous is sometimes it seems that everything is permissible if you're waging war in the name of God. There are no moral boundaries. There are no rational calculations. And you can even end up celebrating death because every victory, I mean, every death of, a, of the enemy is a victory for God. All of that is alien to just war thinking. Um, I was very disturbed to hear that that kind of thinking was uh, happening in Russia in relation to this um, war, and it's going to make it very difficult for, for the Russian Orthodox Church or the Russian regime to back away from what it is doing because it has made it a holy war or crusade. Very dangerous. It's also very hard to argue with. How do you negotiate with somebody who is doing a holy war it becomes very, very difficult. So thank you for your question. And I'm, um, it's very disturbing. It's a, it reveals a very disturbing reality. It is not enough as we think about uh, Christology in relationship to ethics, it is not enough simply to talk about the earthly ministry of Jesus. Um, if, you know, if we have a Trinitarian theology, you have to, you have to look at the entire, you might say, uh, career uh, or behavior of God in, in, the, in the 
in scripture. Um, so it's also another challenge with focusing only on the earthly ministry of Jesus is because it does not appear that he ever, um, ever supported um, even defensive uh, violence, then you tend to end up with a pacifist reading that that uh, knocks every other consideration um, off the table. And so I think this is, this is part of the, the permanent challenge of, of, Christ, of, of an ethic that is, that is based on the life of a person because the, the particular ministry of that person is historically situated. It happened over a brief period of time and we have fairly limited information about it. And, and yet that is the, the fundamental basis on which we build an ethic. And so um, this is one reason why I think the Christian tradition on war is so complicated. Um, because even if you're talking about Jesus, what just war people tend to do is either to limit reference to Jesus or to, um, to move quickly to themes like love and say, well, Jesus taught love, but love sometimes requires self-defense. And so you move over to that level. Um, and, and that doesn't always seem especially satisfactory either. And so Christian thinking about war needs to draw on the entire canon, centering Jesus in appropriate ways, but not only the historical Jesus. And this work is sufficiently difficult that we never stop arguing. We've been having the same argument for uh, many, many hundreds of years. Well, the subtitle of my book says, Why an Ancient Biblical Vision is Key to the World's Future. And a couple of things there. Um, I say an ancient biblical vision, which is a way of saying it's, it's one of the visions that is there in the Bible. It's, but as you said, and as was also mentioned earlier, there are other things that are going on in the Bible too. And I also think it's, it's a vision uh, that in that word in English, it means something to aspire to, something to strive for, uh, to hope for, to seek. Um, never in recorded history has human life or the planet itself been treated as sacred desecrations, violations, rapes, murders, cruelty of every type is a large part of the human story. Um, but so is a tender, loving, passionate regard for human life. Um, sometimes we only see it within family and friend groups, but sometimes we see extraordinary efforts that are made on behalf of strangers. There is something compelling about the idea that every human being that we encounter is sacred and we should act accordingly. Um, we, there's something compelling. When we think about all the mistreatment of people, it's a way to, you might say, measure that mistreatment and say, look how wrong this is. This is not how people should be treated. But it's also uh, a, a stern test of our own behavior as Christians to aspire to this kind of behavior. It can challenge us every day, um, how we treat our family, how we treat strangers, how we treat enemies how we treat people of different races, how we treat refugees, how we treat, how we treat the dying, how we treat newborns. Um, and so I think we need to be challenged by this ethic. It helps us to be better and do better. And I do think it is there in the Bible while I grant that other things are also there in the Bible. This, this ethic also reminds us of some of the major threats to, to it, like nationalism, xenophobia, racism, 
sexism, homophobia. Uh, when you have this ethic and you lay it out, you can see all the ways in which people are tempted to do other things. So take it as, if you're able, um, as a, a vision to aspire to that is grounded in the Bible, that has made its way through 2,000 years, 3,000 years of tradition, that hasn't been killed yet, but that challenges each of us to do better in how we relate to people than, than we are usually inclined to do. Um, in the book, I describe moments in which, while many Christians were doing awful things, other Christians were standing up for this vision. Like, um, people who were opposing anti-Semitism or who were opposing the cruelties of colonialism or who were, uh, you know, uh, standing against, you know, every kind of evil, um, the gladiator games or whatever it might be in the ancient world. So it's a vision. I think it's a compelling one. I think it's a defensible one. It's in some ways it stands at the basis of all law, all law that honors life. Um, and I think it is something that we can be proud of as, as something that we contributed to in the Christian tradition while recognizing that we have so often fallen short and need to do better and better all the time. <laughs>